What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to BBB, Triple B's Bunk Bread Breakdowns. Let anybody tell you differently. Big baller brand is no longer there. Farce. <laughs> we are the real deal. Speaking of farces, we have we're, – we're getting into the all-fade team today, the all-farce team of rookies. I know a lot of you guys have done your rookie drafts already, but hopefully you got some more coming up because we're going to let you in on a little secret about guys that you should not be – should not be drafting in your rookie drafts. We got about 10. We got maybe 11 or 12. They've got their uh, bunk bed breakdowns listener league announcement today as well, which we will probably get to a little bit later on in the show. There's 11 of you guys that are going to be competing against Mike and Noah in a startup dynasty league. They did not even invite me into the league until about five seconds ago. <laughs> and out of spite, I fucking denied their request <laughs> for me to join the league ridiculous you start fucking building a monopoly over here and then all the snakes in the grass start coming out and they start chopping your legs and shit i don't even know what's going on in my conglomerate organization anymore <laughs> i'm ready to fucking go how we doing boys doing, doing well good. i thought you were going to introduce us as the frauds when you're uh introing the show but i'm <laughs> glad you didn't <laughs> i'm glad that that's the way you see yourself though no very, very telling y'all ready to roll today and talk about some real frauds yeah oh, let's get it. all right hit that intro So if you want to just see who uh, the 11 listeners are that got into the league, we'll put a timestamp down below. So if you want to skip right to that and then come bike over here, you can do that. Or you could do us a favor and actually listen to the episode. That would be fantastic as well. But either way, if you want to skip there, then come back because you're so fucking excited. Timestamp down below. Michael, take it away. All right. First up on the list, uh, we're going to start off at the most important position in the NFL. One of the most important positions is Superflex. It's going to be Noah's favorite player of all time, future franchise carrier of the Los Angeles Chargers, Justin the Duck Herbert. So we put him on <laughs> this here. Is, this is like, uh, sorry to interrupt, all right, but this is like when uh, people introduce uh, like women as their future ex-wife. Like, <laughs> Noah, this is like, you already know that this is your future ex-quarterback. Like that I shit hurts so going much, into man. the relationship. People saying I look like him too. It's just, it's a, it's a rough go for me, man. You, you know, there's a lot of heartbreak in your future. Yeah, I've so, had a lot of heartbreak in my past, too, so I'm ready. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, look, when it comes to Justin Herbert, I think there's a lot of good things to say. He looks like a quarterback. He's built like a quarterback. He's athletic like a, like a quarterback. The only problem is he does not play like a quarterback. So, that is why we have him on our all-fave list. And he's going currently as the 10th pick overall in Superflex Leagues, which is the 1.110 for those of you uh, math nerds out there. <laughs> going as the QB3. And the reason why we're fading him is because I think there's better players behind him. You can get some tier one wide receivers, guys like Rager, guys like Jefferson that can go behind him. What do y'all think about Justin Herbert? You know how I think. I don't, I don't want to talk about <laughs> Herbert. For super flex leagues, I actually don't hate him at the 110. But like you say, if, uh, if Jalen Rager is going behind him, I'm completely fine with it. I like how our notes section just says, fuck Herbert. Like, <laughs> that's honestly how I feel in my heart of hearts. But he's the guy that can get you points on the ground and hopefully through the air. But as you said, right, when you can get a guy like Jalen Rager, who I personally have as my wide receiver one, and I think both you guys have as wide receiver two, mm -hmm. uh, there's just a ton of value there. And even in super flex leagues, like we contemplated putting Joe Burrow on this list just because we believe that CEH <laughs> and JT are better values. Um, because when you look at startup drafts, right, like the only quarterbacks really going round one are the top two obvious guys and maybe Dak Prescott and maybe Kyler Murray. Like these running backs are going to go in the first, like late first, early second of startups. And what are the chances that Joe Burrow does, as, does that as well? Um, as for Herbert, I doubt he plays more than like eight games this year. And if you want to buy somebody that's going to improve their value year one to year two, I think if he starts the second half of the year and he doesn't look good, then his value is probably going to plummet from wherever the 110 was, kind of like uh, Dwayne Haskins of last year. Yeah, I think Herbert's a guy that the majority of people – look at the talent and kind of feel the same way that, I mean, he's just a quarterback in super flex and that's the reason why people take him. You know, he was number six overall pick. So there's going to be some value there for a long time, but basically what we're doing in this episode is, is telling you to fade players based on their ADP right now. As Mike said, he's going at the 110. He's the third quarterback off the board. When you have guys like Rager who can be a foundational piece of your actually skill position offense going forward for, you know, hopefully his entire rookie contract, et cetera. Uh, that, that is why we're looking at other positions over a guy like Justin Herbert, where, I mean, he could, you know, you've heard the comparison, but he's like a Mitch Trubisky in, in terms of just like accuracy and consistency. It's got the flashes where you see him make some plays, but like it, it's so much more important to be able to do that over the long run. So Herbert's a guy who 
um, has definitely had his struggles during his time in college. And, and um, typically those kind of things don't get better going into the NFL against quicker, faster, stronger uh, defenders with better coaches and, and better schemes going against him. So Herbert is on our all fade team as the QB one. Yep. And guess, given that this is super flex, we're going to get another QB in the fade. And this one is probably not a shock to anybody. It is Jordan Love, uh, who the Green Bay Packers took inexplicably with their first Two great picks round pick. Herbert and Jordan Love. Love that. Two great picks. <laughs> He's currently going as the 22nd overall rookie in Superflex leagues per May ADP, uh, which is the 2.10 as the QB4. And um, so the reason why, again, like the reason why we're saying fade these guys is because we feel like there's better value later on in the round. And so going behind him is Jalen Hurts at QB5. And I don't know about you guys. Uh, I know he's got lower draft capital, but I think these two guys are kind of in like very similar situations where they're not going to start in the near term. And I would just rather bet on a winner than a loser. Definitely. Yeah, and if Jordan Love starts sooner than rather than later, like if Aaron Rodgers gets hurt, I don't think that's good for him. He's somebody that coming into the league definitely needs a lot more polish on his game. Like I listened to an interview and he admitted, he's like, yeah, I force throws way too many times and I throw too many interceptions. Like you don't really want to hear that out of a guy that's, you know, taking over for Aaron Rodgers. And realistically, if Rodgers doesn't get hurt, I think he has like four years left. So you're basically putting a guy in your taxi squad for two years and hopefully like in that third year, Aaron Rodgers gets cut or something for like no dead cap and he makes it onto the field. As for Jalen Hurts, we know that Carson Wentz isn't the healthiest guy despite all those like white knights on Twitter trying to tell you that he's the best quarterback in the NFC East <laughs> every other day. But he does bring a lot of rushing upside to the table. Unlike Jordan Love, he is kind of mobile, but he's not going to do what Jalen Hurts does on the ground. So I'm um, seeing as he's going a little bit later than Jordan Love, you should just fade the position or trade back, acquire more capital, and then go with Jalen Hurts. Yeah, I, I would. I actually don't hate Jordan Love here, to be honest. I, I the fact that you can get Jalen Hurts after Jordan Love uh, is what makes me not want to take Love here. But I don't know. I, this is one of those things where I kind of step outside the numbers and I'm looking at it from like a football standpoint. There's there's a lot of dysfunction within that organization, right? There's some kind of disconnect between Rodgers, the coaching staff, and the, the executives, whatever's going on there. I feel like usually that stuff plays itself out sooner rather than later, right? You don't just like hold on to that for like three years. So I do think Love gets on the field quicker than most people actually anticipate so his value is going to shoot up as to whether or not you believe he's like a talented player that's really what it's going to come down to it, it it's obviously kind of annoying that you're going to have to hold him onto your bench for a while probably be a taxi squad player but I, I like love probably a little bit more than other people just because I do think something's weird within Green Bay and there will be changes uh semi semi soon I know the contract's up in the air and he's probably there for the next two years minimum uh, but I could totally see Love taking over. And, and in two years, I mean, you're going to be really happy that you held on to Love if yeah. he takes over as a Green Bay starting quarterback. That's def definitely fair. That's why I kind of grouped them into the same bucket. If there was no Jalen Hurts, I would be totally cool with taking this bet yeah. because you're basically – what you're getting is you're basically getting like a protected asset, right? Like his value is not going to decrease. We know that. So it's a guaranteed uh, yeah. increasing value asset. You just have to wait two years. And that, for me, That's the like, thing too. Yeah. It's like – with a guy like Herbert who can get on the field and immediately like play poorly, <laughs> his value, this, all jokes aside, his value can plummet quickly. Like if yeah. we see him have a really poor rookie year, you're not going to want to invest in him long term. But I feel like Jordan Love could not step on the field and have more value than Justin Herbert over the next two years because you'll always be able to sell him with the fact that, oh, he's going to be a starting quarterback. So I would say that his value is going to rise year over year because he's actually getting closer to being the starter there. And we no parallels surprise. to Mahomes and Trubisky here. I mean, uh, we've seen in the past, so maybe that's true. <laughs> because you're, you're drafting Jordan Love knowing you're not going to be able to start him for the next few years. Justin Herbert, yeah. you know you're going to start him, and you know you're going to be disappointed in the second <laughs> half of the year. So you gotta take Is that it possible that Justin Herbert ends up being really good for fantasy? It's possible. I, so, I mean, yeah. it's like Josh Allen, right? Like Josh Allen is not a good quarterback by any means, uh, by any passing efficiency. But you would have like been happy metric. as shit to have yeah. invested into him at the one yeah, time. Yeah, but you would have been happy as shit, which is why I'm, I'm not saying you, you have to fade Herbert in the first round. It's only because I'm seeing Rager going behind him that I'm saying to fade him. It's, because I'd rather it's strictly take Rager. a Rager thing. Yeah, if, if there was no <laughs> Rager, like if there's no Rager and there's no like Justin Jefferson behind him, like I'm totally fine. Like I've never let Justin Herbert fall out of the first round because of draft capital alone. It's just yeah. it's literally just based on the the guys you can get behind him. Yeah, yeah. there's too many good players. And unlike that statement, we have AJ Dillon, another example of the Green Bay <laughs> Packers being absolute fucking buffoons. <laughs> you take this guy in the second round, he has good bursts, he has good speed testing wise. But when you guys watch this guy play, he's like a bowling ball. He just doesn't do anything. He doesn't move side to side. He just goes straight into his into the offensive line. I know Graham Barfield wrote up his yards created. I'm pretty sure he was like terrible in that. 
And he hits like he checks all the boxes that you want out of a running back, right? Like size, adjusted speed, uh, the burst, the draft capital. But after seeing Green Bay sink a first round pick into Jordan Love and like a third round pick on an H back, do we really hold much value in him being a second round pick? And on top of that, I think personally, like his value is completely tied to Jamal Williams and Aaron Jones not coming back next year. They're both free agents. And I just don't see a world where if Aaron Rodgers is still on this team, that they head into the season with Devontae Adams as their wide receiver one, just Syed Deguara as their tight end one, and A.J. <laughs> Dillon as their RB one. I just – I don't see that happening. They're probably going to re-sign one, if not both, of those other running backs, and they do everything better than A.J. Dillon other than being, like, 250 pounds. Yeah, I was going to say it's no coincidence that we have two Packers back-to-back -back on this list because they were terrible fucking draft picks in real life as well. A.J. Dillon's, like – it's funny our analysis on AJ Dillon just like as a brand here has been sort of a roller coaster because I remember <laughs> yeah. the first episode we got on I was like yo I cannot believe that dudes like AJ Dillon when I watched <laughs> him he could he's, he can't move from side to side like he yeah. never makes dudes like miss DK and, then we, calf, but behind center. and then we saw yeah yeah we saw him on at the combine and he blew shit away and then people were like going back to my tweet when I was like this guy sucks we were like yeah what about now and I'm like I mean <laughs> fucking he's just a fat <laughs> fucking asshole who runs really fast but like for legit like you said with Graham Barfield yards created he was one of the worst he's ever scouted he's just not elusive and the only way a guy like that gets it done is if you're like you need to be in like the LeGarrette Blunt type role New England you know circa New Eddie England Lacey type of role yeah 2016 yeah Eddie Lacey was way better than fucking <laughs> Eddie Lacey was actually like pretty nimble for his fat ass he was like you know he wasn't always fat too Eddie Lacey like used to was a beast at one point and then you know he ate his way at out at one league. single point he was a beast. <laughs> one year. yeah one single point and then he went and got a fucking Big Mac and it was, it was all downhill from there but AJ Dillon uh this is tricky. He's another guy that I'm not like, I'm, I'm personally not fading him altogether, but I don't, I don't love the value here at, I guess, 208. Cause if there are guys like, who else is going after him? The Antonio Gibson's Gibson. going, well, he's the RB nine. I think he's like early third round. Yeah. That's really close. But if, if there are guys like LaVisca Sinault that fall uh, behind him, like I know in one of my drafts, I took LaVisca at 208 or 209. Yeah, I think me too. D Dylan was probably like one pick before or after, and I'm taking LaVisca every single time yeah. there. But Dylan is like, like you brought up the RB contracts. I mean, Green Bay clearly has no idea what the fuck they're doing in terms of, of like signing and directing <laughs> and shit. So they could end up signing Aaron Jones to a longer term deal. They're going to let one of those, one of those guys go for sure. If it's Williams and Dylan's going to have a carved out role. Like I do think the fact that he was a second round pick is definitely going to be uh, something to be factored in. I think it gives him more of a floor than a ceiling, but just the type of player he is tells you it's so tough because Aaron Jones has been so fucking good on the goal line and like how can you take how can you take him off the goal line right he's been the most efficient goal line back since he's entered the NFL like statistically speaking and yep. when you watch him he's just so shifty in those tight spaces but then you know Green Bay is gonna be like oh but AJ Dillon like look at AJ Dillon how can we not <laughs> give him the ball on the goal line so that's where it gets really really complicated I feel like uh his ceiling is shot as long as Aaron Jones is there but I do think he has an okay floor. So if you're a team that, you know, you're competing, you have really good wide receivers, and all you need is, like, some kind of bottom barrel RB2 production, I don't necessarily hate Dylan. But I mean, he's definitely not a target of mine by any means. Yeah. He's another one where you have to kind of be patient, right? Like, same with Jordan Love. Like, literally everything that Green Bay drafted, you're just not going to get much fantasy production in year one. Like, you have to wait on Jordan Love. You're going to have to wait on uh, AJ Dillon to see if, like, Aaron Jones or Jamal Williams leaves next year. So, and then, but, like, for running backs, the thing is, like, those first, like, four years of the rookie contract is, like, basically where they make their money. So, you don't want to lose, like, 25% of that production investing in him. And, again, it just comes down to ADP. If there wasn't an Antonio Gibson behind him, if there wasn't, like, a LaVisca Chenault behind him, like, I'm totally fine with it because he did get the draft capital and he has very plus-size athleticism. But uh, I think just replacement value – kind of like drops him down a little bit for me yeah, yeah me personally tough. like I know Derrick Henry scarred me for life but I just don't want to invest in a running back that can't <laughs> catch passes and I was going through PFF's draft guide he dropped three of 24 catchable targets throughout his entire college career so one that tells you he can't catch because he's not getting targets and two it also tells you can't catch because he literally can't catch if he Bro, drops like, one of Aaron Rodgers passes he's gone he's like the, into the the underworld or wherever the, the, yeah the first the first I think Dylan was the first write-up I did in our draft guide and, like, the very first stat I found is still the stat that blows me away. His still freshman is. season, he had 300 carries without <laughs> a fucking reception. I don't, even, I don't even understand how that's possible, you know? Like, and that's the thing. Like, I don't know. He needs to be in a position where he's getting a ton of goal line carries. You can't trust that to happen with Aaron Jones there. Not going to catch passes. So, 
like the way to adjust his speed score is cool, but in, in, in theory, but not in practice, you know? So yeah. uh, AJ Dillon, not a guy that I want. I do want to stick one in here before we go down the ADP uh, that's in between Dillon and Josh Kelly. That wasn't on the list. Uh, Darrington Evans is yeah. a guy that is a, is, is a big time fade for me. I think he's going off probably around the same area as like McFarland uh, a little bit before Kelly, probably. Mm-hmm. I don't he care what people say. Going as the RB nine, nine, ten, uh, eleven, RB eleven. Right after McFarland. Right. So yeah, right between Dylan and Kelly there. So, Darren, I don't care what people say. This was the worst fucking landing spot you could have. <laughs> like people, he could have landed in 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 New York in uh, on the Giants, and they would have been like, good landing spot for Darren. <laughs> we get it. like everyone likes Darrington Evans' uh, talent, right? Like really explosive, like fun player to watch. But dude. Derrick Henry is going to command. You talk about the rookie contract, man. This is 25% of the contract. If you think yep. Evans is doing anything this year, you're wrong. I also think that, like, okay, do you guys think Derrick Henry is with the Titans next year? No, I don't think so. I do. I'm in the mindset that he is going to be there because their game plan just completely revolves around him. I don't think they all of a sudden go from, okay, we're going to run the ball with Derrick Henry 26 times a game, who's our, like, 250-pound back, and then all of a sudden – flip it to be okay with a 203 pound back being the guy. I just think they've built that offense too much around him. And Henry's like still 25 years old. He only has one year of workhorse, uh, you know, like volume on his, on his resume. So I don't think like they're going to look at him and be like, Oh, he's old and washed up. I he's going to be Henry- 27.9 by the start of the next season. I think cause he's a, he's like a January birthday. Really? Yeah. So like, like nine still. One. Yeah, so he actually will be pretty. The, re- the reason why I don't think they're signing him though is because like they tagged him, so it's like he's twenty five right now. Yeah, he's yeah, twenty five right now though. But so. he's like twenty five point, you know, whatever it is now. By, by, the start, <laughs> by the start of the season, he'll be twenty five point nine, right? And then by the start of next season, he'll be twenty six point nine. So like nearing twenty seven. Yeah, but I mean, but that's not twenty five. Twenty six is not like a death thirty row running backs at all. Yeah, he's basically. We've actually had row. this. This is like deja vu. We've had this <laughs> so many times. <laughs> Here's the thing. I I just I think Derrick Henry. Like I don't know what their financial plan was. You know, maybe it was because they knew they had to sign Ryan Tannehill. Maybe they were holding out in hopes to uh, to sign Jadavian Clowney. I don't know what their mindset was, but it made sense to just tender Henry, get those pieces in place, and then worry about him next summer. That's the way I'm looking at it. I just don't think they just hand the keys over to Darrington Evans. Like, uh, I, yeah, there's no world that happens. You know what I mean? Like, there's there's no upside there, and you're you're missing out on on the rookie season. So, from a fantasy perspective, like I like Evans Evans as a player a lot, but I just I, I don't see any way I'm taking him over like an Anthony McFarland or yeah. like. Dylan or whoever these guys are around yeah him. that was that's it actually uh, that's a good one because like in the rookie drafts I just like find myself like I always had Darrington Evans available and I was just like eh, don't want him. I'm just gonna draft Anthony McFarland instead even though he's like worst capital just for mm-hmm. those reasons you said I mean to be honest with you like I was even like debating taking DJ Dallas over uh Darrington Evans just because he has a clearer path to like actually getting like touches and getting to yeah. play on the field right so uh, yeah I, don't, I, I actually like that one and also just like you just don't want to invest in scat backs that don't, that don't have a path to like a lead role it's yeah, just like, you're, you'll just be like trying to talk yourself into those guys year over year about how high their ceiling <laughs> is, and it just never, it never yeah. happens. So yeah, and then like right, be, right before they, right before they have their like uh, Duke Johnson season, you trade them. <laughs> exactly. Oh, I can't wait for this next one, Mike. Why don't you kick this right. off? Next one, uh, another fantastic pick by the hometown Los Angeles Chargers, Joshua Kelly. Um, I, I I see a lot of people getting super excited about him here uh, because they think they're gonna he's gonna like be like Melvin Gordon light. Uh, I just don't see it. I mean, I know Noah, you spat out that really interesting stat where we saw that he broke less tackles, uh, forced less broken tackles than than uh, Joe Burrow last year, um, which just isn't good to begin with. I mean, this guy's playing the Pac-12, so it's not like he's playing against legit defenses either. Um, but he's going currently as a 29th player overall, so basically the mid of the third round as the RB12 which doesn't sound bad, but then when you look at guys that are going after him, guys like Lynn Bowden, uh, SEC rushing leader last year as a quarterback, guys like DJ Dallas, who's like nice sleeper potential, someone that we like based on the film analysis that Nick has done and, and uh, Noah has done. And you got KJ Hamler, a second round wide receiver who everyone hates for some reason. I don't know why, but there's just like so many more options better than him after him than like drafting some sort of like handcuffy, like running back. I just, I don't know. I just don't, I just don't really get the Josh Kelly look. There's a I lot of pieces. I don't think he's any better than fit. Justin Jackson. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, people yeah. just assume, like, they act like Josh Kelly was a second. Like, he got picked where A.J. Dillon was. <laughs> like, if that yeah. was the case, then I'd be way more confident. But, you know, Justin Jackson has been good when he's on the field. If he could stay healthy, I don't think the Chargers, you know, necessarily just hand the keys right over to, to, uh, to Josh Kelly. But, like, 
he's, he's a guy I've, I'm, I'm like super indifferent about. He's definitely not a target of mine. He's not like a guy I necessarily want on my team, but I'll take him, I guess, if he falls to me, but I'm definitely not excited about it. Cause I mean, Eckler's the guy back there. You don't have to be getting 24 touches a game to be the guy. And that's what Eckler's going to end up being. Josh yep. Kelly's one of those players where if you're like the 408 and he's there and you take him, you're like, oh, nice. I got Josh Kelly. You're not like <laughs> yeah. excited that you got him. You like, like, look around, you're like I, I couldn't let him pass me by, you know, like I had to make that pick. And you look at everybody else and you're like, yeah, I didn't want him, but you take him. But you take him. <laughs> like, what does he really bring to the table? Like Eckler's going to catch all the passes there. And obviously the passes going to go down with Tyrod Taylor, or Justin Herbert under center. Justin Jackson's still going to spell Austin Eckler. The goal line role, I guess, is still up in the air, but do we expect them to be in that position as often with a rookie quarterback in Tyrod? Like, I don't know. It's just not like a sexy landing spot. It's not great draft capital. He had a good combine, but I just don't see the role that he carves out in this offense. Yeah, I mean, I brought it up before. I just think, like, the, the best comparison for him is, is like a Mike Davis type. He's, he's, he's a good NFL back guy that could do it all, but he's never someone that you – want to put into your lineup unless all the other running backs are hurt aside him so he's just it's not not a fun ceiling okay floor is a real nfl running back but uh that's really about it for joshua kelly yep and joshua kelly's excitement is only to be outdone by our next fade which is lamical poor man's josh kelly (laughs) poor man's josh kelly lamical p ryan uh i don't know why anyone's even remotely excited he's currently going a as the 40th pick so in the fourth round so you're not investing much in him, and I get it. People are like, oh, well, he's not costing much. But when you look at who's going right behind him is DJ Dallas. So 100% Ooh. of the time, I'm going to click the smash on DJ Dallas over Lamichael, especially after they signed the the ageless wonder, Frank Gore, who basically, I guess, I forgot about to play that. till he's 50. <laughs> right? It's so, so annoying that they did that because there was, there was going to be one asshole in your league that took P. Ryan, like Animal took P. Ryan in our league. He was really excited. He tried to trade up to get P. Ryan, and then like <laughs> six hours later – the the Jets signed Frank Gore. In this yeah. world record, the first person to be excited about LaMichael Piron being drafted. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, people get excited about the fact that, look, the Jets want to get rid of Bell, whatever. But, like, at the end of the day, Bell's a workhorse. There's just, like, it's, like, not a high score on offense. So, you don't want to invest in those types of, like, roles anyways. So, for me, I'm fading LaMichael Piron, and I'm going to take DJ Dallas or maybe even, like, Trout God or one of the tight ends going later. Yeah, I'll, just- I'll throw off some uh, – no, go ahead. I was going to say, he's like a much less athletic Ty Montgomery. He catches passes and he can't run really well. And Ty Montgomery had zero usable games last year. Even the game that I think Le'Veon Bell missed, neither running yeah. back, neither Bilal Powell or Ty Montgomery did anything that week. And I'm not sure what the matchup was, but like they want to commit to Le'Veon Bell for how dumb that may be getting like 3.2 yards per carry. But it's a bad offensive line. It's not a good offense. Even if he does start, like what are you going to slot him in on a weekly ranking? Like, a running back three like there's not much to be excited about Michael Piran and I agree with you Mike like DJ Dallas who has a legitimate chance to take over that role if that starting role if Chris Carson isn't ready week one that's just an easy smash yeah I can't believe Dallas is going behind him I can't imagine that will be the case going forward uh now that Frank Orr is signed but yeah I'll throw out a few more stats because I tweeted this out like last week about Piran when I was uh looking up some some more stuff about him after after Animal drafted him I want to let him know how bad of a pick it was I started <laughs> com- com- compiling stats just to throw at him so basically he did nothing his entire career besides that 40 catch senior year right but before that the three years prior the volume wasn't there but the efficiency was terrible as well like that 40 catch senior year was one of the worst like catching seasons of all time 6.6 yards per reception and I'm looking at what he did on the ground uh in terms of like his broken tackle rate I was looking at sports info solutions he ranked 89th among like 120 NCAA running backs in 2019 94th the year before that and then 135th the year before that his broken tackle on receptions ranked 89th uh, his 6.6 yards per reception ranks 147th yards per target 143rd so there's a, there's nothing on his profile that you can like other than that 40 catch season which was extremely inefficient his senior year like I, I compared him to like Buck Allen where he's big so you want to talk yourself into this like big workhorse size guy that can catch passes but he does legitimately nothing good so please yeah. don't draft my uh, this is uh, this is the Kalen Balaj of 2020, guys. Uh, people yeah. got excited about Kalen Balaj because he had a, had some nice catches, had like 40 catches or whatever it was, but just wasn't that good. So yeah, he got definitely me started ducking at passes. So. <laughs> and he doesn't, he doesn't even he's not even like built like like cool like Kalen Balaj. Like you could, <laughs> you could roster Kalen Balaj and be like, yo, but like look at that motherfucker, you know what I mean, and get excited about it because of that. But Piron doesn't even have that going for him. So. Yeah, he's related to Samaj, and that guy was pretty good for a little bit. <laughs> Are they actually related? No, probably not. not. It's to be like a Booger McFarlane type of thing where we speak it <laughs> into existence. It would make sense. Like they're both the same running back. They just like don't do. Any- they don't do anything. Yeah. Exactly. yeah.
Yeah, just, just right. one one lesson you'll learn from P Ryan if you do invest in him, and one year from now you come back and say, "Sorry, I didn't listen to you guys." Is you don't invest in backups thinking they're going to become the starter next year when someone leaves because they're not good enough, and there's always an incoming rookie class. So just Facts. don't make that mistake. Yeah, usually the the rookies that are good enough to be the starter are competing right out of the gate. They don't yeah. you don't, you don't get drafted to be a backup. To <laughs> yeah. they don't do like like the way they draft Jordan Love to be the quarterback <laughs> of the future. They yeah. don't do that with running backs. They're not that valuable of fucking picks. So I think, uh, I think they'll groom P Ryan there. He fits the scheme well. Get like two and a half yards <laughs> of carry and catch like a two yard dump off. I heard uh, Adam Gase is the running back whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> Bro just like stares them down with his googly eyes until they fucking run the ball. He's like, this is how you elude tackles. (laughs) (laughs) Watch my talk wideouts. I'm enough of fucking P Ryan. All right. Next up, wideout. Uh, Pretty popular name. Definitely one of the more divisive ones. You know, we've been pretty firm where we stand. I know Nick actually still likes him a little bit, uh, but it's Tenor Ruggs uh, currently going as the 14th overall pick off the board. So, which probably would be a first round pick in your regular one QB leagues, uh, 2.02. Positional wise, he's going as a wide receiver five. So after the big tier of CD Lamb, Jalen Rager, uh, J- Jerry Judy, and Justin Jefferson, um, and the reason why you know I think I'm fading him here is just because the wide receiver class in the next bucket runs so deep. So I don't really want to invest in like a top of the tier when I can get guys who I like, who Noah hates and Nick hates later on, but guys like T Higgins <laughs> and uh, Lavisca Chenault and. You know, Brian Edwards, uh, some of these guys you can get for much cheaper. So that's kind of why we're fading him because I don't want to pick him that early. Like, what do you guys think about? Are you guys comfortable taking him as a wide receiver five? Yeah, I don't think that that price is, like, egregious. But as you said, right, when you can get guys like LaVisca Chanel, I'm not sure where he's going, probably, like, the 209, 210 range, or, like, a Brian Edwards who's been consistently going, like, early round three. Obviously, I think Henry Ruggs is the better player. He got picked higher. But for fantasy purposes, right, Brian Edwards is going to be in that possession role for the Las Vegas Raiders that we saw, like a Michael Crabtree do well in. Uh, LaVisca Chenault walks into Jacksonville where they gave D.D. Westbrook over 100 targets last year, and Chris Conley had like 90. So there's just so much more opportunity in other places, and it's not like those other receivers are bad too, right? Like Henry Ruggs is good in his own right, but those other guys are very talented. So as you said, Mike, I've been on the clock early round two, and he's just been staring me in the face, and I tried to move back, and I just couldn't, so I had to bite the bullet and draft Henry Ruggs. But <laughs> that's not to say I don't think he'll never be good for fantasy. I think that he's going to be a high upside player that definitely in best ball is going to give you a ton of value. But um, as you said, like that next tier isn't that far off from Ruggs, and when you have to pay that price when you can just drop down and get other guys that are very similar, uh, that's definitely what you want to do for fantasy purposes. Yeah, I'm, I'm starting to get like unreasonably high on, on LaVisca Chenault, I think. Like, Same I, here. I'm not really sure where this came from. I was not really high on throughout the entire process, but the more I think about that landing spot, like the more I like how they're probably going to use him. But that, the same goes for, for, for Rugs. Like the reason yeah. why I like Rugs relative to other people is because most people are stupid and they don't understand how the Raiders are going to use Rugs. Rugs is going to be a line, of, a, line, a line of scrimmage type of guy. Yep. Like R- Rugs is not uh the Sean Jackson Ruggs is Ruggs is bigger Ruggs is uh I don't want to say faster Ruggs is uh taller Ruggs is heavier Ruggs is Ruggs is a different version of the Sean Jackson the Sean Jackson is a, is a deep threat go down the field and get the ball Ruggs is like get the ball in his hands quickly and let him use that speed to make defenders miss a lot of slants a lot of screen plays a lot of right by the line of scrimmage which tells me that he has more more uh, of a floor than I think people realize because they're going to manufacture like you can't manufacture hell Mary's right like yeah. you're lucky if that shit gets complete but you can manufacture touches by the line of scrimmage so I think Ruggs has a higher floor than most people realize and maybe he's got a lower ceiling than I think a lot of people are giving him credit for so you know we all like to to say that Brian Edwards is um, probably like the, the possession receiver but they also took him two rounds later so they have a plan for why they wanted Ruggs so much worse than why they wanted uh, Brian Edwards so like Ruggs Again, he's not he's not a guy I'm going to be targeting. Like I'm definitely not taking him over those top guys. Like I'd rather have the Judy and, and those types of guys. But uh, but I'm not going to be mad about getting rugs on my team because I, I do think that he will uh, surprise people if they use him correctly. I think he'll be a really good fantasy asset, which I don't I wouldn't put past Gruden. So something that uh, like I just did a rookie draft and I was sitting there at the 202 and I was hoping no sorry 203 maybe and someone traded up in front of me to grab uh, Henry Ruggs and I was like super sad because I thought they were trading up in front of me to get Keyshawn Vaughn. Uh, it's like a 0.25 points per carry league. Would you guys take Henry Ruggs or Keyshawn Vaughn? Because that's like a third round wide r- running back versus like a number one wide receiver overall. Yeah, Ruggs. Yeah. For me, it's Ruggs easy. I think the Vaughn train is getting a little too fucking out. I think you're paying for like hopefully a one year like 
hopefully top 15 running back because like they could draft someone next fucking year and Vaughn yep. could be Vaughn could be in Rojo's position now next year. You know what I mean? Like, and that's probably like a likely outcome. So um, I'll, I'll definitely take rugs there. I was in sister. I was in a situation. I think it was a two hundred one and two hundred two, and I just grabbed both, so I didn't have to make that decision. But when it comes down to it, I think I would just go Vaughn, unless you really need a receiver. Which in dynasty, I mean, you can acquire them pretty cheap compared to a running back. But uh, I'd rather just take the shot on Vaughn, in my personal opinion. Yeah. Um, next up, a San Francisco wide receiver, Brandon Ayuk. Who are we is- all going to be wrong on Brandon Ayuk? Like. No. Are we all is no. he just gonna ball out and like we're all just gonna be like, oh well it was Shanahan's scheme, we should have known that he was yeah. um but I mean like it's not like Shanahan is some like wide receiver whisperer, you know what I mean? Like got True. got Dante Pettis, uh got Debo Samuel last year, which was who's good, right? But but who went after Debo Samuel was AJ Brown. So like I I'm not like I don't think like when because he landed there, I'm gonna be like, Wow, this guy's like super good because John Lynch and you know Kyle Shanahan are some like wide receiver whispers. So to me, I'm not really taking that into account, but he does have the draft capital. He's currently going as the 18th player overall or the 2.06. And again, comes down to the fact of who's going behind him, right? Like we have guys like LaVisca Chanel, who I have been like in love with ever since I found out he, he got drafted by the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, who's going as a wide receiver 10. We got Brian Edwards going behind him as a wide receiver 11. Just a couple guys I like a little bit more. So more options back there, which is why he's a fade for, uh, for me. And also like, I mean, I've said as many times, but I just, I don't like him from an analytical profile perspective. Guys like him just don't really succeed all that often. Could he break the mold? Uh, I'm sure he could. Right. But I'm just, that's like a bet that I'm not willing to make. Yeah. For me, like you want receivers that can do like one of three things, right? Either catch a ton of passes that gives you a lot of value in PPR catch a ton of touchdowns or give you deep plays, right? He's not going to be a guy that's going to catch a lot of passes because this team last year went to the Super Bowl, passing the ball 49% of the time. I don't see that changing much. Even if it does, he's going to be well like third in line behind Debo Samuel and George Kittle. He's not going to be a touchdown threat because I looked it up. The San Francisco 49ers were fourth lowest uh, pass percentage in the league to throw to their wide receivers. That didn't make any sense. I'm sorry. Uh, They threw to their wide receivers the fourth lowest percentage in the red zone. Uh, rate, Jimmy, Jimmy Garoppolo just doesn't look there. What happened? Use the word rate. They threw, <laughs> they threw to the wide receivers at the fourth lowest rate. <laughs> My bad. Uh, and on top of that, right, Jimmy Garoppolo is not throwing the ball deep. He threw the ball deep 31 times last year, which tied with Drew Brees as the least among all quarterbacks with over 10 uh, games played. And Drew Brees only played 11. So he was throwing less than two deep balls per game. And we want Ayuk to be that downfield burner. He's also really good after the catch, but I just don't see the volume there for him to return value. Whereas you can get a guy like LaVisca Chenault later who has a similar skill set in an offense that's actually going to have volume in it. Yeah, he's in, he's like what Mike said with uh, – was it Josh Kelly? Whoever it was that you were like, oh, he keeps coming up. Oh, no, it was uh, Darrington Evans. It's like when Brandon Ayuk keeps coming up on the clock, I'm just like, nah, I'm not going to I'm not gonna pick that guy. It's like you could make the argument either way. You could be like, this is the good, this is the bad. It's just – I don't – there's just not a lot of – he's going to be one of those players who are definitely better for the NFL – than he is for fantasy. I think it's kind of clear given that best case scenario is that he's the third most used weapon in an offense that doesn't really pass the ball that much. So the ceiling really isn't there. Maybe the floor is there, but uh, around that same spot where you have guys like Visca, I mean, his ceiling is so fucking high that I don't think it warrants even looking at Brandon Ayuk. Do we have another guy on the Michael uh, Pittman. What's up? Michael Pittman or Brandon Ayuk? I'll take Pittman there. I'll take sure. uh, Pittman because they're both kind of like same style of profile, but I think Pittman can win in a couple more ways than he can. Yeah, so the next guy up on our list, and I can't really even say that he's on my list because I took him in uh, one of my rookie drafts recently at the 204, which I don't regret. The reason I regret it is because I, I don't know why. I wanted Michael Pittman really, really, really badly. I mean, <laughs> T. Higgins ends up in Cincy where he'll have every opportunity to succeed, right? He's coming into the same year as Joe Burrow, their new quarterback for X number of years. So they'll have the chemistry there for a long time. Um, some, it just – Higgins was another guy from, like, when we ver- very, very first started doing these dynasty videos. I, I just – I don't see a lot of, like, playmaking ability on the field past, like, his electric, you know, jumping and getting up and getting the ball. I like players who can make plays with the balls in their hands. And uh, Pittman was just a guy that I saw him do that like so often this year. You know, he just looked kind of dominant. And the more I saw tape on him, the more I liked him, which is why I regret the pick. So with Higgins, it's not necessarily I hate the landing spot, but I do think they're the fact that he's going to 203, there are a lot of good players that are getting picked like right behind him. 
Yeah, for me, it's the same case as Henry Ruggs, right? Like, he probably deserves to be going around this range, and I chose him too. I think I was, I got him at, like, the 205, but I don't know. I just feel like year one, it's going to be hard to beat out A.J. Green if A.J. Green is healthy. And then on top of that, like, what if Joe Burrow, Joe Burrow struggles? What if, what if T. Higgins isn't on the field? Like, his value is going to plummet, kind of like a Nikhil Harry this past year, right? He was going, like, as a top five dynasty, as a rookie pick last year. And now this year, sure, you might say, oh, I'm not going to sell the 112 to get Nikhil Harry, but, like, you're mid round two and people are still not pulling the trigger to acquire Nikhil Harry for that price. I can kind of see a similar situation to T Higgins where if, if he's not on the field and Joe Burrow goes out against like Baltimore twice a year and the Steelers twice in his rookie year, and he shows a little bit of struggle. Like I think if it's not the safest bet, right? Because if T Higgins goes out his rookie year and he plays really well, you're not gonna be able to acquire him for less than what you've got him in the startup, but in your rookie draft. But I just think that a guy who like Nick said, right, he's really good at jump balls. We've seen in the past people that don't, come into the league polished and aren't like able to separate and rely on those jump ball skills take a little bit to develop and that's not to say I don't think T Higgins is ever going to be a good player because I think his skill set fit, fits Joe Burrow really well because we saw him with Jamar Chase just like throw so many dimes down the sideline but year one to year two I could see his value kind of dipping off whereas a guy like Mims or Chanel a little bit later we have to pay a cheaper price for, to get them could kind of have a more steady price and then you could flip them a little bit later Mike I know you have a different opinion I know you love T Higgins so uh, tell me why I'm so wrong on this. Dude, I love Tid Higgins, okay? I love everything about him. Uh, when he got picked to the Bengals, I love that too. I, I just think, like, look, if we're going to believe in Burrow, which I do, and if we're going to believe in this organization for now, which I do, because I do think they have a good offense, um, they do use a lot of three wide receiver sets because uh, what's his face? Zach, Zach Stacy, is that his name? No, uh, comes Zach from Taylor. Zach, 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 sorry, Taylor. Yeah, Zach Taylor. Too many uh, fat come, running backs. Yeah. The Bengals <laughs> fucking wish they had Zach Stacy. Yeah, Zach Taylor does year. come from, uh, you know, did like come from, uh, fuck, what's his name? Sean? Dude, I'm McVay. blanking on names today. Yeah, Sean McVay. <laughs> uh, Don't worry about coaches. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he's coming from that philosophy. So, look, uh, Auden Tate got on the field a decent amount last year when he was healthy and he was able to ball out a little bit. So, I think him playing that third fiddle to Boyd and AJ Green is going to be good for him because he's not ready to be a wide receiver one. Um, but I do think he will, he can be someone that produces your one because you can manufacture touches. I don't think he's just a deep threat and a jump ball specialist. I think he has understands like nuances of the game pretty well. We know that he like, I, I love like analytical profiles where guys break out super early. And, you know, he is someone that just like got on the field right away uh, and produced as a rookie and then blew up as a sophomore and continued to ball out. So I, I think like I, I'm buying that offense and I'm buying that tie with Joe Burrow. And if Joe Burrow is what we think he is, um, even if he doesn't like blow everything out of the sky, like Mahomes in the first year and he doesn't puts out like a decent year, um, I think Higgins is going to be part of that. And then I think trying to buy him after is going to be a little bit tougher because you're going to have AJ Green leaving. So, People are going to have that built-in expectation that Higgins is going to be like the guy, the dog going forward because we know Boyd is more of like a flanker role. So I think like from that perspective, that's why I'm kind of fine buying on him uh, at his current price. Yeah, yeah, for me, if I'm like contending right now and I know I'm like kind of impatient, which is counterintuitive for Dynasty, but if you know you are in that mold, I think that T Higgins is somebody you'd want to fade just because even Mike who believes in him thinks as well that he's not going to have a great rookie year. And if that happens, if he has like a JJ Sega white side type of rookie year, or a DJ Chark, and you sell them for a lot less than that they would, that they should be going for based on their draft capital and their college production, then you're losing out on a ton of value and you're probably selling them to somebody who's rebuilding and is going to reap those rewards. And if you do sell them for like a 2021 20, second and you pick a receiver that's in the same mold as T Higgins, then you'd probably just get T Higgins all over again and get another guy who's not going to produce in their rookie year. So um, that's why I just think that maybe if you wait and if these hypotheticals all play out, you get to skip out on his rookie year where he isn't productive and you get him in that year two like bounce. But uh, as you said, Mike, yeah, it's, it's pretty risky to do it, but I'm a man that gambles on the charger. So <laughs> I'm not afraid to put my chips in the middle of the table there. Yeah. Uh, I think next one is a pretty easy decision for, for me and for Noah. Um, but it's Chase Claypool. Uh, this pick kind of boggled me a little bit. And at first I was like, eh, like Pittsburgh picked him. Maybe I should take another look. I took another look. Just I still can't do it. Uh, he's, he's currently going as the 27th overall pick at the top of the third round at 3.03 as the wide receiver 12th. Um, the reason why I can't do it is because KJ Hamler's going right behind him. And for me, it's like they're very similar situations. Uh, obviously, you know, Pittsburgh might have a better passing defense if Big Ben is healthy. But they're both kind of like that third, fourth option. But Hamler just has like a way better profile. And what if we're wrong about like Jerry Judy, right? What if Jerry Judy's not everything he's made out to be? Like they took Hamler in the second round. 
uh, we can, you know, people make the case that he's a decoy, kind of like Ruggs is a decoy. But I think both in both cases, like you're not going to invest a first round pick and a second round pick with the intent of making them a decoy. Like that's like a stupid concept to me. Sometimes they turn out to be that because they're not that good. But I think just like at his price, uh, I've been finding myself clicking the draft on Hamler a lot. Yeah, he he's like one of the best values, just straight up best values in drafts this year. I think that like there, if if we look back and he does well, if he plays out and has like a really good rookie contract or whatever, there are just so many reasons you could point to why that happened. One, because he's a really good player. Two, because he had second round capital. Three, he has great speed. Four, like we're talking about all these weapons that they have, but like, I mean, it's Sutton and then the rest of them are unproven as fuck. So one of them falls out and then, you know, Hamler could be, like you said, the second target. I don't, I mean, I'm not going to say I think that's going to happen, but what if this offense takes a really big step forward and they actually become a good passing offense? Like that's also in the cards here. So um, Hamler has a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things to like about him. The situation is clearly dragging him down really, really far, but Hamler's definitely a guy that I would be investing in right now. Yeah. But this segment was about Claypool. So what do you think about Claypool? <laughs> oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Uh, yeah. I mean, Claypool is interesting in the fact that he got such early draft capital and it's the Steelers who draft wide receivers so well. Um, Wait, Nick, but I cut you off. I have a tweet that some Steelers fanboy sent me about six foot two and taller receivers drafted by the Steelers <laughs> in the past. Chase Claypool this year, Martavis Bryant, Justin Brown, Lima Swede, Dallas Baker, and Fred Gibson. And then he follows that up with Jeez. Brown, Swede, Baker, and Gibson combined for 20 career catches. Fred Gibson did, however, score seven points per game in the NBA D League in one season. <laughs> <laughs> so that's yeah. a pretty good hit rate. Yeah, I mean, someone, like, someone else actually uh, put out a pretty cool thread. Uh, I forget his Twitter handle, but I think like 2-9 or something like that. And he basically went through each team's draft picks at wide receiver. And it turns out like the Steelers weren't that good at drafting wide receivers. We just remember it so much because they got AB in the sixth. Uh, you know, they got Emmanuel Sanders, Mike Wallace, all these guys. But they had like a 25% hit rate, which was like just like average. So that kind of. That honestly me- might have been me. I put out a tweet super similar to that. This was like last year, I think, or maybe like two years ago. Everyone's like, oh, the Steelers are so good. But I'm also like, you know, you if you get a couple big hits, you, yeah. you get known as, like, the team that drafts, but you still also have, like, fucking 30 <laughs> misses. That's just, yeah. you know, it's the way it works. Um, yeah, so, like, I mean, that I'm not going to take the 6-2 <laughs> or bigger, like, thing for uh, for face value there because that's just, like, so nitpicky. But most people don't like Claypool just as a prospect. They don't think he can really separate at the next level, and it does make sense. So if you want to buy into the whole Steelers thing, go for it. I think that's probably the wrong process to play when you're doing Dynasty, though. Yeah, Mike, you hit the nail on the head. Just watching this guy play, I just I don't understand. It's very similar to Miles Boykin last year, his former teammate, where he tests super athletically, right? Let's, runs like a four yep. four at, at a huge size. But when you watch the guy play, he's not like jumping up and mossing people. He's not burning people deep. He's used like over the middle, like a tight end. And from everything we've heard, he's not going to be a tight end in the NFL. They just brought in Eric Ebron. They have Deontay Johnson there. They have Juju Smith Schuster there. Like, there's just too many mouths to feed, and I just don't see how his skill set fits into the Pittsburgh Steelers offense. Yep. Uh, so, I mean, I put out a tweet today earlier on this, but if you're on the if you're on the clock in the third round and you're thinking about drafting Claypool, first see if Cam- Hamler's available. If he is, take Hamler. But second, try and flip that third and just send it to the James Washington owner and try and get James Washington. I don't like either player, but I would rather bet on James Washington going forward than I would betting on Claypool. Yeah, I saw that. That was a good tweet. I, I agree with that as well. I think. Washington got like people started shitting on him so much that they, he had like some good flashes last year where he had yeah. some good games. I'm like, he could still be good if Big Ben is actually healthy and on the field. So um, I, I like that a lot. I think yeah. the 2019 wide receiver class kind of ruined our per- perception of young receivers in the NFL. Like before that year, we didn't expect any of these guys to really produce in their first or second years. And the fact that like Debo Samuel, AJ Brown, DK Metcalf, all these guys just broke out. Guys like James Washington, who I think are going to like their third year, right? Like this is the trend that they should be going on. Whereas Chase Claypool probably isn't going to fit into the mold of an AJ Brown, who if he ever becomes good, is going to take a few years. And I, Mike, that's like a beautifully crafted tweet. Like if you want somebody who is (laughs) going to provide any value for you, it's going to be James Washington, who is going into his third year and has shown that he's actually decent at football. Yeah. Speaking of like, uh, I I don't remember who tweeted it yesterday. It might've been Ray or it might've been someone that does like Debbie. And they were talking about how, like, imagine Etienne and uh, Najee, like, those guys came out this year in the class, how bad the running back class would be next year. Yeah. It, it would be so brutal. I, I wish it happened, like, just so I could <laughs> send that tweet over to Scott. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, Scott, your picks next year don't fucking matter, bro. Give me all of them. You'd have Rich uh, anyways, on the phone in yeah, two seconds. Sorry. 
Yeah, uh, let's talk about tight ends. Yeah, uh, we're going to talk about one tight end, and it's <laughs> tight end one off the board. We'll talk about uh, one tight end because there's literally only one tight end <laughs> being drafted in rookie drafts. <laughs> yeah, and it's Cole Komet. Uh, he went in the second round to the Chicago Bears. First of all, shit, just a shit situation to be in because that team is awful. Um, they do have Nick Foles, so maybe a little bit of an upgrade, but he's currently going as the 31st pick overall in rookie drafts as the 3.07 as a tight end one. And to be honest, I don't think any tight end should be going in the third round. Uh, I like, I'm not, I'm not drafting any tight end in the third round unless it's a tight end premium, at which point I would consider Trout God, who is going as a tight end too. But Komet, just like when I watch him, I just get a worse Kyle Rudolph. And I just don't, there's nothing about him that excite me. There's nothing that, you know, he's going to go and compete against Jimmy Graham, who's old as fuck, of course, but like Jimmy Graham's still going to be Jimmy Graham for the days that he is healthy. And honestly, it's just like, just don't invest in tight ends, period, but definitely don't invest in Cole Komet. That's my advice. If you're holding yeah. weight in the fact that the Chicago Bears took him so early, also remember that they signed like 15 different tight ends and they also brought in Trey Burton for probably an absurd amount of money and he did absolutely nothing. So yeah, putting a lot of draft capital and weighing that heavily about Cole Komet uh, isn't smart to do. Maybe it's just the Notre Dame offense because Chase Claypool also looked like absolute garbage in college too, and so did Miles <laughs> Boykin. So maybe they just ruin NFL careers like it's nobody's business. But uh, yeah, Cole Komet is somebody I'm not too high on. I'd much rather Adam Troutman, who's coming from a smaller school and he was less athletic, but in that New Orleans yeah. offense that wants to use tight ends, the fact that you can get him a little bit later, sure, he's not going to produce year one, but Cole Komet's gonna pr- not going to produce in like year 25. So I'd much rather take that bet. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't think anyone's going to be producing in year 25. But, <laughs> but, but, but point taken. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely not taking Cole Komet before uh, Adam Troutman. I, I mean, if you, if you just look at things objectively, like the situations they land in are polar fucking opposites. And the, the, the worry about New Orleans for Troutman is just that, like, what happens with Breeze? But the signing of Jameis Winston should – make you feel really good as a Troutman owner because Winston like he'll throw his fucking 25 interceptions but he'll also throw like 10 red zone touchdowns to tight ends like we saw <laughs> we saw him make Cameron fucking break like an eight touchdown a year guy for like a three-year span so if he could do that Troutman can do that so long term I'm not really worried about it because they brought in Winston so if you have to pick between one of them like everybody else in this class every other tight end is a complete dart throw that should be a waiver wire priority pickup and not drafted in the actual draft itself uh, but if you have to pick between these two and you're obviously not drafting both of them, go with Troutman over Cole Komet. Yeah. And I stopped, dra- I stopped trusting Bears draft capital when they traded up for uh, Trubisky <laughs> over John Watson. Also, Thanks. just a friendly reminder, they drafted Adam Shaheen in the second round as well, the 2017 draft. So it's not like they're a great place for evaluating talent. So, Dude, did Riley you see, you don't like did that you see the 2015 tight end draft class? Oh, I saw that tweet. That was disgusting. <laughs> Yo, it wasn't even like I left anyone out. It was straight up 19 <laughs> out of 19 misses. Every tight end <laughs> like drafted. George Kittle, and- I'm like, wow, there was no hits on this draft. It wasn't even like an average, like not even like a Blake Jarwin, who at least someone could be like, oh, yo, I'm pretending to be excited about him. There was not one fucking guy on there that was like a legit still. And maybe there's a one like blocking tight end or something that I don't really know about, but holy shit, that was ugly. Let's talk about something a little prettier. And uh, that is the bunk bed breakdown listener league winners. What do you want them to do if, if they do uh, win this? Do you want them to email you somewhere or what? Uh, we want them to pay into the league. I'll DM all these guys so they know that they actually you won. want them to, to send offers. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely send uh, offers. Send um, nudes. Mm, Yannick's no nudes. Lead, so no I don't nudes. know about that. <laughs> No, uh, so awesome. Mike and I are going to be sharing a team, but the rest of you guys, there's obviously 11 other spots and Nick is not one of them because he's not a loyal listener. So at the 102, we have our man Serge on the beach. We found Love him. Love you, Serge. Um, we also have Anana Nubis, uh, FF Guru 420. And then in the iTunes store, our man, the big peen 11. <laughs> a really nice review. Uh, and then also Mr. Devins to you, Eno SC underscore on iTunes. T fell nasty Twitter, Josh Verzi, uh, 704. Keep pounding T Matt 1989. I know when you were born and the jump rope. So you guys were the lucky winners. There weren't too many others. So I'm sorry if you got left out. I kind of feel bad about that, but uh, I'll be either DMing you. If you are on iTunes, reach out to one of us because I have no clue how to contact you through there, but we'll get you in the league. We'll get all paid in. We'll draft as soon as we can. And Mike and I will try to take you guys down, but we're the biggest frauds in the industry, so we'll probably go like 0 and 12 this year and just disappear into the night. Probably, uh, but yeah, we'll post a graphic. Uh, some of those were pretty hard to pronounce. We'll post a graphic showing you 
who won and just DM us on Twitter or DM us on, uh, uh, what do you call it? Discord. Uh, and we'll try and uh, get things organized and going. That's it. Nope. Last thing. <laughs> what the fuck? This week's <laughs> narrative. Had to get this off my chest because it was pissing me off. But this week's narrative. Hit the narrative. <laughs> Speak on it, Mike. All right. You need to sell CMC so you don't miss the sell window. Shut the fuck up. That's all I have to say on this, okay? Because, because look, no disrespect because, look, I mean, I'm sure there's smart guys in there that, oh, are, hell of a here disrespect. that are crunching numbers out there. But this is, this is, like, fantasy just doesn't have to be hard, guys. It just doesn't have to be hard. But for some reason, people love to make it hard. Like, CMC is one of the is a once in a decade type of uh, a fantasy asset. And I often compare him to Marshall Falk or I compare him to LT. And that's not a hyperbole, right? It's like actually warranted based on what he's done. Um, if, and I put out a tweet and we'll try and share the graphics if we can. But if you look at them through the first, uh, first three years here, uh, like he's very much on par with what they did. So through the first three years, CMC had 623 carries, 2.9K rushing yards, which is pretty incredible, uh, 24 rushing touchdowns, 303 receptions, 2.5K receiving yards, and 15 receiving touchdowns. He is more efficient as a receiver than most wide receivers, okay? Compare that to LT. LT had about 1,000 carries for 4.5K rushing yards, 37 rushing TDs. What a fucking beast. Uh, 238 receiving uh, receptions for 1.5K yards and five receiving TDs. So 6K total yards from scrimmage and 42 TDs. He's the GOAT. No doubt about it. Thank you. Falk. All this Chargers slander today, I needed to hear. <laughs> Falk, 801, 2.9K, uh, 29 TDs, 164 receptions, 1.4K yards, and four receiving TDs. So 4K uh, yards from scrimmage and 33 receiving touchdowns. So CMC is kind of like right in the middle of these two, right? And people are, are like scared about selling this guy after his first three years because they think that he's going to hit some sort of like age cliff or whatever. Do you want to know what LT and Falk did for the next five years? They put up damn near 10,000 yards from scrimmage and 77 to 99 touchdowns between the two. Are you trying to fade this once in a generation <laughs> asset? Like I put out a meme on this. It's the Drake meme. And literally like I, it boggles my mind that people worry about winning trades more than winning championships. If you have a championship roster with CMC on it, you better fucking give me your firstborn, your secondborn, and be willing to chop off your dick because I'm not going to sell him for anything less than that. Yeah, that's, that's kind it. of a fire. That's kind of a fire saying right there. I think we could put that on merch. Winning <laughs> trades, greater sign, winning champions. <laughs> yeah, for like, dynasty players. But wait, hold on. Christian McCaffrey's 23.9 years old, which means he'll be, 20, 30. he'll be 28 <laughs> by the time next season starts. Yeah, so but he catches passes, so he's not Derrick Henry. So dude, can, ten, almost ten thousand yards from scrimmage over there. We, you know what? You know what's happened over the last few years? We've been accustomed to to running backs getting work for like a couple of years and then just getting thrown fucking into the trash. <laughs> yeah. So when we see a guy like Christian McCaffrey, our first instinct is like, you know, you've been fucking heartbroken by someone so many times, you can't be crawling back to that, right? So David Christian McCaffrey <laughs> is like scaring people. We're here yeah. to tell you, don't be scared, baby. Don't, Don't be scared. scared. We're, we're going to jump right through in. this together, except yeah. for Noah, because he trades away Christian McCaffrey. Yeah, we'll Noah did a that. trade. Noah did a trade. And I'm, we're not saying, like, punt away like Godfather offers, right? Like, we talked about what you should trade Christian McCaffrey, McCaffrey for. You should not be trading him at value. You should not be trading him at value of a typical 1.01, because he is not a typical 1.01. You should be getting a Godfather offer where you literally bend the other side over and get everything and everything they have. If you're not doing that, just don't sell if you're competing. Just win. Just win, baby. Yeah, I'm a nice guy, so I didn't completely bend them over. I kind of just gave him a kiss on the cheek and said goodnight. <laughs> but, like, I think I got Josh Allen, uh, the 106, Joe Mixon, and DK Metcalf for him. And then Devin Singletary, Jameis Winston, and Devontae Parker. So it was like a downgrade. For, it was an upgrade. You, you, from better hope, you better hope Winston don't play starting quarterback for the next <laughs> ten, 10 years or else you fucking took that one in, in, in the hole, man. I know. that That's the only thing I'm kind of concerned about. But in that league, the reason I did that trade is because I had Kyler Murray and my QB2 is Ryan Fitzpatrick and then Jameis Winston. And I'm kind of competitive, so it did hurt to see CMC leave my roster. But um, I got basically startup pick-wise, like, two seconds for CMC and then like the 106 and DK Metcalf for like Devonte Parker, Devin Singletary and James Winston. That's how I yeah. kind of looked at it. So I definitely didn't get the Godfather hall that Mike is talking about, but 
Um, yeah, he's definitely somebody you don't want to go out and like actively try to sell. You brought up the sell window. Like his sell window is a bay window and every other running back sell window is like a prison cell window. Like his cell <laughs> window lasts from now until yeah, how long, started. how long were you thinking about that one? For? <laughs> a while. I was trying to cut in earlier. <laughs> My mind gets stuck on one thing, but you know, he's a guy who's going to catch a ton of passes. I saw some tweet. I'll see if I can find it, put it on the screen, but I think of all players through their first three years in the NFL, he had like the third most receptions behind like Jarvis Landry and Michael Thomas, which yeah. is absurd. Yeah. It's just, it's just insane. Like you just can't fade this type of, this type of player because the point advantage they give you in a single slot is insane. Like if you're in a, if you're in a league that plays eight starters, first of all, don't do that. Just expand the roster size. But if you are like, you should not trade Christian McCaffrey period. Like there's yeah, like, trading, like th- there are cell windows are a thing in dynasty fantasy football, but like cell windows are for guys like Julio Jones, who's 31 <laughs> years old, not a 23 year old Christian McCaffrey guys. Holy yeah. shit. He's almost this is the best fantasy so you can kind of justify it, but all right, boys. That's the strongest I ever felt about any opinion in my life. I just had to say it because I saw too much of this bullshit over the week on Twitter. Just hang in there we and just win. Shit. Just win, boys. Love you. Hit that thumbs up if you enjoyed. Anything else? Not that's it. Outro.